Thanks for sticking around for the last panel of SF Blockchain Week. Today we have a really exciting panel um, with some awesome funds, you know, focusing more on that aspect. And they do bring, bring their global perspectives here, but I'll let them introduce themselves and sort of what they're working on and investing in. Um, but I'll sort of start off and say, I'm Nancy, I'm with Multiplied. We are a blockchain PR agency based here in San Francisco. We work with a lot of companies on communications and content and strategy, and some of our clients include Binance, Gods and Train, Cypher Trace, and Seller Network. And so I'll let Simon and Martin take it away. Uh, hi, uh, this is Simon at Hashid. Uh, I'm a co founder and managing partner at Hashid. Uh, Hashid is the uh, leading and uh, might be the largest uh, blockchain investor from uh, out of South Korean market. And also, we are, are making a uh, lot of uh, acceleration stuff for the early blockchain project. Uh, we invest in very global, globally, so half of our portfolios are based in Asia, and the half of our portfolios are based in the uh, United States as well. So we are building the uh, two uh, entire different continents to make our synergy. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Martin. Um, I'm heading Nasper's uh, Ventures, uh, based here in San Francisco. Uh, Nasper's uh, might be the largest technology investor you have never heard of. Um, we, uh, we are a very old company. It got started as a newspaper about 100 years ago in South Africa. Um, think, you know, like the San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> and the, uh, the uh, now chairman of the company uh, in the 80s, uh, he did an MBA in the East Coast of the United States, and he saw HBO and then um, took the company that was basically print publishing, magazines and newspapers for 70 years. That's what they did, and invested into pay TV built a big pay TV business in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and then also invested in telecom, and then in the internet about 20 years ago. And the idea was to always see what sort of innovation is coming um, and what can the company invest in based on where they're already at. So they didn't go from print to genetics, even though that was in the 80s already a hot topic. So they went from print to TV to telecom to internet. Um, and started investing a lot into uh, emerging market uh, internet plays like 20 years ago before that was an obvious thing. So into Russia, into China, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, and elsewhere. Um, and we are now a global holding company of uh, basically stakes uh, in technology businesses, um, ranging from mostly more than 10% ownership up to 100%. Uh, percent. So we control some of the companies, some of the investments are minority stakes. And the whole idea of the Ventures Group uh, is basically to see what's the next wave of innovation happening and uh, play in that. And that's why I'm sitting here now. Blockchain is uh, one of the things that we think is potentially um, a step change uh, in a computing paradigm, a little bit like the internet was uh, maybe 20 years ago. Um, personally, I moved here from Europe 20 years ago to be part of the first uh, boom here, uh, the internet boom. Unfortunately, my timing was very off because I arrived in March of 2000. Uh, I think on March 16th and March 20th was the all-time high of the NASDAQ for the next 15 years. Um, so I had to wait a little bit uh, until uh, the wave arrived. Um, but it, it, it helps to have a bit of history of, of, of the two decades having seen a lot of these uh, ideas that were proposed at the time. And then in 2000, 2001, everybody thought they're stupid. Um, until now, 20 years later, actually every one of these ideas is, is at least a billion dollar company uh, around the world. And so that's why I'm excited about blockchain. It might take some time, but overall I think that we're really onto something here uh, with this topic. Right, right. And I would love to hear, you know, how did you guys get into crypto and blockchain? Everyone has a crazy story, but would love to hear your guys'. Uh, so uh, I majored in computer science and engineering uh, in university. So uh, due to my uni university major, uh, I recognized the value of Bitcoin in early days. But uh, at that time, I uh, didn't uh, any investment. That's my uh, big mistake. Mm -hmm. But uh, in sometime 2015, uh, Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, uh, visited Korea first time to promote Ethereum. Uh, at that time, uh, Vitalik was nobody, <laughs> also in South Korea. So there were only uh, kinds of 10 people came together to meet Vitalik. Uh, I was not there. But uh, one of my close friends, uh, one of the reporter of a major Korean media went there and interviewed Vitalik first as Korean. 
Uh, and after that day, uh, I had a dinner appointment with the reporter. And uh, over two hours, he always uh, to uh, told me about the value of uh, Ethereum and uh, the insight of the Vitalik. So yeah, I started my own research after the dinner. And I fi finally uh, found it. This is the a whole new uh, infrastructure. And not only for the technology stuff, it's uh, more about building the entire new e uh, economy all over the world. So yeah, from that day, I jumped into the uh, blockchain space. And yeah, now we are yeah, growing in the new continent. Love it. And yeah. what about you, Martin? Um, so uh, four and a half years ago, I was CEO of a company that when Cisco Zars was on the board. Um, and uh, so I became CEO, and he joined the board at the same time. It was non, not related to one another. So we had our first sort of chat to get to know each other. Um, obviously, by then, he had founded Zappo um, and talked about it. And uh, probably many of you know, he makes a very convincing argument for why this is interesting. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I uh, didn't really take his advice. <laughs> um, so I didn't invest in this. It would have been much better. Um, then doing it in 2017. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's the story. But I've been um, uh, really digging deep for about the last two and a half years into the topic. That's awesome. And so, you know, if we're looking at our current ecosystem today, we have certain hot topics. I would say DeFi being the most prominent most recently. And the other side is gaming. And I'm curious, what are your guys' philosophy on gaming in blockchain? So uh, I think blockchain gaming is a very uh, important sector uh, because it could be a, a kind of uh, initiative to make a virtual world. So I, I want to uh, share my think thinking about uh, why virtual world is very important and how blockchain technology could be a, a fundamental infrastructure to virtual world to lear. So uh, the reason is uh, I have a strong thesis that uh, after 10 to 20 years, the major living space of human being uh, could be shifted to the virtual world. So uh, many of the uh, science fiction movies already uh, handle this kind of prediction. So uh, I want to uh, share more about what is being in virtual and what is being in real. So I strongly believe I am uh, real exist in the real world. And all of you guys are also strongly believe you are real. But there might, there might be a truth that we are a kind of gaming avatar controlled by someone outside of this universe. So how can you believe we are really exist in the real world? So let's think, of, think about some of the scenarios in the virtual world. Uh, for example, uh, uh, um, might uh, some of you are familiar with the movie Avengers and the villain Thanos? In the movie, Thanos can uh, make a finger snap and suddenly uh, swipe out a half of the entire creature in the universe. That kind of accident cannot be happening in the real world, so it, it is virtual. Uh, like this, uh, most of the game suddenly could be shut down, or economy of game item could be manipulated by an operator of gaming company. So that is also virtual. All of our uh, digital personal information could be uh, also manipulated by some of the big platform companies, like as Facebook or Google, and could be leaked uh, eleventhly. So our data is also virtual. So let's think, think the other hand. Uh, let's, uh, let's think some of the scenarios in the real world. Uh, imagine we hold on ice cream. It is always cold and should be melt outdoors by a Newton physics. And uh, I can use my cellular phone anywhere in the world, in my room, uh, in my working space, in my home country, South Korea, and also in the United States. So these kinds of real product support interoperability in the real world. And then I can believe my smartphone is real. Uh, similarly, uh, we all uh, have a strong belief that the sun always lies from the east. So this is the fundamental belief from the uh, natural law of the universe. 
So that kinds of fundamental protocols, such as natural law or Newton physics, could be a strong substantial of the uh, entire universe, and then we can believe our existence uh, in the real world, and then we can build our society, economy, and even civilization. Uh, like this, if we shift our living space to the virtual world, there should be a strong protocol uh, as a substantial uh, of the virtual world, and then finally, we can believe the existence of the virtual world and then uh, the real economy and uh, community and uh, civilization could be uh, appear in the virtual world as well. And blockchain uh, help this. Hmm. And what about yeah. you, Martin? Um, I mean, there is, you know, the sort of virtual worlds had, have had a few maybe false starts uh, for a while. Um, I mean, Korea, 2006, SciWorld, uh, everybody was on SciWorld. Uh, for kids, Habo Hotel was like a thing out of Finland at the time. Um, and obviously here, Second Life. I actually met Phil Ro Rosedale in, I think, February of 2006, um, when the company was on, I don't know, the cover of Time or Business Week, anyway, one of the, the magazines at the time. And everybody thought, like, wow, this is going to be, you know, it's going to be the next, like, thing, and it's, it's just about here, and there were other worlds as well. And somehow it didn't happen. Um, and uh, how, however, regardless of you know uh, virtual worlds, gaming ever since has has uh, has grown tremendously. Um, and in a way, those are you know virtual worlds as well. My two kids, they're they're fanatic. Um, uh, they're almost addicted to Minecraft. Uh, they spend a lot of uh, time there uh, building, uh, playing with other kids. And they're just much more digitally native than I ever grew up. Uh, and, and for them, having a virtual item is almost as real as having a real item. Um, if it's uh, you know the, like the special thing, and uh, so they, uh, it's it's sort of easy to see if you just fast forward another you know another decade from from where we are, um, that this could be much much bigger uh, than than where where we are. And actually, if you look at sort of the, the, the size of the gaming industry, um, the big step change has always happened with some sort of change in platform or, 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 or business model or some sort of functionality. First, it was the arcade, um, and then that sort of uh, topped out at some you know, level uh, of uh, market size. Say, the whole, if the entire gaming industry is you know, there about 100 billion, maybe it's a bit more. Say arcades were 10 billion, now maybe they're a little less. And then the, 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 the console games and the PC, and then especially mobile. Uh, and in between that, the Facebook thing. So there's always some step change, and none of the previous platforms went away. Um, and it grew to a much, much bigger size than any, anybody thought possible. Um, and I think maybe true digital ownership is sort of the thesis why we have started investing into, into blockchain. Um, Maybe that could unlock sort of the next wave, and maybe that wave is much bigger than the ones, all, all the previous ones uh, combined. Um, and because really, if you if you if you you know break it down, what does what, what does blockchain do? It's ultimately about digital scarcity. Um, it's a digital bearer instrument that nobody so uh, outside of a walled garden. I mean, inside of a walled garden, digital scarcity is not is is not complicated at all. But outside of it, that, that's really the true innovation of, of Bitcoin and, um, and Ethereum and, and all the rest. And then I ask myself as an investor, OK, so that's, that's a step change. Now, OK, so this is a wave maybe we can catch. And you never know how big is the wave going to be. You also don't know, you know when's the right time to catch it. Timing is very important in investing. Um, but in terms, of, uh, in terms of catching that wave, in what sort of you know, industries will this, will this manifest itself first? And what I like about gaming is, this is a, it's, the, the thing is virtual, right? So I think the challenge with you know, tokenizing real estate, and I'm not saying that's not going to happen, um, but that's like a thing in the real world. And so ultimately, somebody still needs to point to, OK, this house exists, and you know, they actually own the title to the land, and you know, I, I inspected the apartments. It's not just a piece of junk. Mm -hmm. Whereas virtual, the thing is virtual, right? You don't need this like, real world pointer uh, to it. And just in terms of adoption, that's probably one of the areas where, where, where blockchain is going to be mainstream first. Um, and no matter how big it's going to be, but you know, uh, personally, I think uh, this could very well be a step change in terms of how big gaming is and whether it's gaming or virtual worlds and how big this is, really the sky is the limit. And yeah, there, I mean, there's plenty of 
fun um, sci-fi novels um, that that you know paint these you know possibilities for the future. Right, right. And how would you guys say you know we talk about these virtual worlds? How would they essentially influence or I guess allow the new economic society for people to happen? Like, what will that look like? Um, so uh, I think there are many strong evidence uh, the virtual world, uh, virtual asset market is uh, growing quickly. Um, some of the strong evidence is uh, so many of uh, Generation Z and some of the millennials are spending more and more time uh, into virtual world, such as uh, gaming, esports, or streaming sector. The reason why is, uh, this is my opinion, but uh, many of Generation Z and younger kids uh, truly believe that they'll be on uh, their job place, like as their parents, uh, 10 to 20 years in the real world. So that kind of uh, job place at the virtual world is uh, really growing. And there are already some of the uh, big success uh, players to make a real profit more than the traditional sector. Uh, one of the examples is uh, some of the top esports players make up a, a lot of money more than the traditional sports player, including soccer, baseball, or basketballs. But, uh, uh, and also the nature of uh, this kind of virtual world is uh, on top of digital platform, so uh, really easy to issue a new digital, digitalized uh, asset. Uh, there are, I can introduce one of the strong uh, examples. So there is an, a Hong Kong gaming blockchain company named Animoca Brands, and they issued an official F1 uh, virtual car on top of Ethereum and one of it sold more than 100K USD. So, yeah, so that kind of uh, happening could not uh, make in the real gaming space. It, it can be happen because uh, the virtual F1 car on top of uh, Ethereum could be uh, really uniquely uh, exist. I personally believe within three, three to four years, there should be an expensive uh, blockchain-based game item up here uh, with more than uh, 10 million USD value. And that kind of uh, happening could not uh, appear in the traditional gaming space, I think. Yeah, look, it starts with private property. I mean, um, most, most successful economies have the concept of private property. And uh, now blockchain really enables this in a non-walled garden way. That's really about as simple as, uh, as, as I see it. And what is that? Does the United Kingdom have private property? I don't know. I, it would appear so, but I don't know. You seem to Flat think no. Right. Okay. So maybe you don't own the land, but you know you can own a car. Um, and uh, you know, digitally now you can own uh, you know uh, in-game items or uh, the the, uh, the the virtual items uh, within uh, within Sandbox. And we actually uh, so we invested in a um, Australian company called uh, Immutable. Uh, they released a digital card game, uh, Gods Unchained. Uh, it's one of the more popular Ethereum-based. Uh, uh, games out there. Um, they're also going to launch a marketplace where the, um, the owners of the cards can trade those cards. Um, obviously, the offline equivalent of that is uh, Magic, uh, the gathering, where plenty of people own the cards and you know, meet up in, 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 in gaming shops uh, in an offline world. And once you own the card, you can, you can trade it, you can buy it, you can sell it. Um, and this is now, we now have the tools for the digital uh, equivalent. Um, of that, and I think it's going to unlock a lot of things. Right, and I think that goes into, you know, how are items that are made in the virtual world, how do they actually attain value? Well, by, um, you know, that's supply and demand. Ultimately, somebody, you know, valuing them or not. That's, that's what it's all about. It's like, why do diamonds have value? You know, they're not particularly useful for anything or even gold. Um, but people value them, ultimately, because they're scarce. It's all about, you know, yeah, scarcity and, you know, is there a market for them? 
Yeah. Right. No, and I think it's very exciting that, especially for you, Martin, Nasper's Ventures, you know, traditionally a tech and food focused firm is now bridging into blockchain, right? And I'm curious, you know, what's your vision for the crypto space? Um, we will see. Uh, it took 20 years for all these good ideas of the first internet boom to come to fruition. And, you know, Webvan was like this thing uh, that everybody thought is stupid. Um, and now, I think this week, uh, Amazon said you're going to have free grocery delivery if you have Amazon Prime. And, uh, you know, basically there used to be a bookseller 20 years ago, and then they bought uh, Whole Foods, and now they're making grocery delivery like a thing. And if you had predicted that in 2001, everybody would have said you're an idiot. Um, and now they don't think that anymore. Um, and I think it's impossible to say how long it will take or what sort of the path it will be. It will meander and the sort of stop and go. And I think if you look at the price of Bitcoin, um, there's like, you know, boom and then a bust and then it sort of trades sideways for some time and then another step change. And nobody really knows why suddenly, you know, suddenly it goes up and people try to predict this. But, you know, I don't, I don't think you really can. Um, and, uh, but you got to be... Look, investing is, is like surfing. You've got to be in the water if you want to catch a wave. So you've got to play. Um, and if you don't play, you, you also don't have skin in the game in order to really pay attention. Um, and obviously, it's not the only thing we invest in. We invest in many other things um, as well. But uh, I think, again, it's a, it's a tr this is a true step change. This notion of digital ownership is a true step change. Um, and the P2P nature of the protocol, that's a true step change. This is just something we haven't had before. Um, and you know, at the, that's, that at the minimum is real. And now what you build with it, what people build with it, and how it's going to look like in you know, 10 or 20 years. Again, we are a 100-year-old company. We think in decades. We don't know when it's going to catch on. But I cannot imagine a world that isn't going to be more virtual than the one we live in. Because I look at my job, and you know, my parents, they don't know what I'm doing. Again, you know, what, you're doing email? What does this even mean? Um, why are you, you know, like, what do you make and what do you do? This is like inconceivable to someone in, you know, who grew up in you know, the 1930s or 1940s, how we live our lives today. And it doesn't take too much imagination to just fast forward another 5, 10, 20, 30 years to just this virtualization of things um, that is just going to be much bigger. And blockchain is one of the key building blocks of this, of this private ownership within that world. And that's what it's all about. Right. And I think when we look at blockchain gaming, you know, it definitely, at least in my opinion, has not grown as fast as we all had hoped mm -hmm. for. I mean, so when do you expect crypto gaming to become, I would say, mainstream? Mm -hmm. And what does that journey look like? You know, what are some obstacles that we're currently facing and would have to overcome to really achieve what we call mass adoption? Yeah. So uh, I think the blockchain gaming industry have to solve the two uh, major problems ahead of us. So first thing is uh, we have to find out the formula about uh, what is the successful model for the blockchain gaming is. Uh, let's think about the early mobile gaming uh, ecosystem. Uh, at that time, uh, lots of uh, mobile gaming spread it out from the early App Store or Google Android market, but only few of them make a real success. So uh, some of them used uh, a characteristic of the touch screen and some of the function of um, mobility such as a social graph, and that kind of functionality enables to collaborate with uh, their friends or competing with their friends uh, by online. So these kinds of characteristics make, uh, made a formula for the successful mobile gaming is and made a big success, such as uh, uh, Angry Birds or Plant and Zombies or Clash of Clans. So I think uh, blockchain gaming uh, sector should be follow this kind of uh, path to find a real uh, successful model. And what is the best model for utilizing non-fungible token and uh, with, with the long last fun? The other challenge is the distribution channel. So as I mentioned, there was a app stores and an Android market for the early mobile gaming sector, but there are not that exists, that kind of distribution channel in the blockchain space. Uh, 
So uh, Ethereum is the largest public chain uh, enabling smart contracts, but the truth is the daily active addresses of Ethereum is under a few hundred K a day. So that's not that big number to nurture the developer ecosystem. Uh, I think uh, two major blockchain projects from Asian market will be a huge gateway for the uh, non-crypto users. So there are Clayton from KakaoTalk and Link from Line. Uh, I guess some of you are familiar with uh, KakaoTalk. Uh, KakaoTalk is a dominant messenger app based in South Korea. Uh, more than 95 of South Korean people use KakaoTalk every single day. And Line is a similarly uh, dominant messenger app in Japanese market and some of the countries in Southeast Asia. They have, uh, uh, for the KakaoTalk, more than 50 million monthly active users. Line has 180 million uh, monthly active users. And uh, we all know that Libra by Facebook will delay a lot due to regulation stuff, but Clayton and Link already launched their mainnet and they already announced that they will launch their crypto wallets and DApp browsers, integrate with their messengers first quarter next year. That means at that time, every single South Korean and Japanese people and some of the people in Southeast Asia can uh, use uh, blockchain gaming without any specific knowledge how to, how to save their private key or how to install DApp browsers or MetaMask kinds of stuff. So yeah, so that, that kinds of, uh, distribution infrastructure will really de deploying within a few months, I think. Uh, yeah, so I think the only uh, defensibility for the blockchain project is not for their source code. So I, I can fork Bitcoin a night, but uh, nobody uh, will use it. So the community and network effect is the uh, only uh, defensible uh, mode for the uh, blockchain ecosystem. So yeah, uh, so yeah, so that's my uh, thinking. Okay. And what about you, Martin? I mean, when do you see blockchain gaming exploding? And what are some obstacles that we sort of have to overcome to really, you know, get people like, uh, I guess, the ones on Kakao Talk to actually use it? Um, I mean, look, the, uh, I think the uncomfortable truth is, is that the non-blockchain content is just better. Um, and it will, it will, you know, it, it will have its, 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 you know, inflection point moment once it, uh, the, the games are, are, are what people really like. Um, and when that is, it's, we, again, we can't say. I mean, CryptoKitties, when it came about, I thought it was brilliant. It was super cute. It sort of, you know, was a use case for, for this NFT idea. Um, and then like they had this like genetic algorithm you could breed them very clever but then after you know you, you've you've you had seen it very quickly and then it became stale it wasn't engaging long enough um, and now I think the uh, so these, these trading card games I think are actually a, sort of a good form factor mm -hmm. um, but again the non blockchain gaming studios and that's you know 99.9999% of the market um, is that their content's just very good. It's just better, I think, and you know, but it will be better until it isn't. And, yeah, and, then, <laughs> and then it will take off. Because right. it does have this drawback of you don't actually own it. And at some point that will become a problem. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, as funds, are there certain projects that you guys are looking into, really interested in? It could be ones you haven't invested in, or you could just chill the ones you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we are very bullish about the uh, uh, sandbox. Uh, so it's a similar 
a game uh, such as Minecraft, but all the asset and building blocks are are stored in the uh, blockchain infrastructure. So uh, any creature could be uh, sold or could be landed by uh, anyone in the ecosystem, and that enables to make a real uh, money and make a profit. And the other one is uh, Dev.com. Yeah, it's a uh, kind of initial distribution channel about the blockchain gaming space. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we've invested in Dapp Radar. Uh, uh, we're also investors in SimilarWeb. Um, and Dapp Radar is sort of the kind of the analog, uh, the, 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 the same thing for, for, for Dapps. Um, uh, immutable, as I mentioned. Yeah, we've, we've probably met 200 companies in the space. Um, we're very selective in our approach, but I think we're out of time. So. Yeah, yeah, we are. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this panel. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. And have a great rest of your weekend.